started. Hopefully, hopefully some additional people will <clears throat> log in shortly. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the first leadership meeting after the holidays and hope that you all had a, a really wonderful holiday with family or friends or however it is that you chose to, to, to spend them, um, that they were restful and, and that you were able to start the new year with some degree of hope. <laughs> uh, Nicely said. <laughs> I, yeah, although if you've listened to the news between January the 1st of the day, that may have dissipated already, who knows. Uh, anyway, to this evening's leadership meeting really was kind of a, um, it's, it's out of the usual every other month, but we felt that because we have a um, special concurrence meeting coming up on January the 22nd, that it was really important that we gave anybody who was interested the opportunity to be able to meet with and hear those folks who have worked on the Colorado election security position paper. I want you please to keep in mind that what they have come up with, they have spent hours and hours researching, uh, probably as many hours debating and, and discussing uh, among themselves um, to make sure that they didn't get something overlook something that was important. They have tweaked and retweaked. Um, I have to say I've edited and re-edited um, many, many times. Yeah. Tonight is your opportunity to be able to um, hear from them and to ask questions of them. Just very quickly to give you some background information, this committee was formed because it came to their attention that Oregon was in the process of wanting to submit an, a privacy, cybersecurity, and election security position paper for adoption at the 2022 National Convention. And as the, these folks began reading the election security part of it, they had some really serious concerns that it wasn't as inclusive as it needed to be, particularly since our election process is coming under such scrutiny and there is, is so much that is being done to build in restrictions, this group of, of folks really felt that it was extremely important that some of those, um, some of those areas that, that they felt needed to be included, be included. So this committee's work is based on the foundation that Oregon supplied um, they spent almost three years putting this together, and when we reached out to them initially, they did not feel that they had the time or even the bandwidth to go back and, and make changes. And so we have been in contact with them. The desire is uh, to present this as a standalone position, and uh, we do have members of the Oregon group who are supportive of this. So what I would like to do, we have uh, Gacy Weiss, uh, Neil McBurnett, and um, Maude Norell has kind of taken the chair, chairmanship role. I'm gonna have each of them, starting with Maude, introduce themselves, and then I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Maude so that she can, she's, she's come up with a wonderful, she and her committee have come up with a wonderful presentation. I think we've got a small enough group that it may be, It'll be really easy if you guys, I'm assuming you all know how to go down at the very bottom of the screen. There's a little funny face that has reactions. If you have a question, if you would just raise your hand and I'm gonna step back and kind of be the, the traffic cop. If you, if you would prefer to use the chat, there's an icon at the bottom that allows you to click on that and you can post a question in chat if you'd rather do it that way. And, in that way, hopefully we'll be able to get everybody's questions asked and don't be shy because these folks are the experts. They've worked on this a long time. So Maude? Um, Karen, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. Did you wanna do a round robin of introductions to start off? Uh, sure, we can do that. Um, uh, if you don't, if you would rather get right into it well, because I, this is exciting I, stuff, that's just yeah, great, I, that's I fun. Really, yeah, I think I would okay. kind of prefer to do that. Excuse I mean, me, but I, yeah. I think that we had thought of uh, having people put 
an introduction into the chat. Right. And that right. will give uh, a record to that too. And, and, and let me ask you too, I just thought about this. If you, if you have some, if, if, if you have questions or something that you really feel you'd like to have more in-depth conversation about, if you put your email in the chat, then we can follow up on that as well. Um, the whole purpose of this is to make sure that everybody gets what they need. So Maude, take it away. Um, greetings. I also want to mention that um, Tony Larson, who is not in our meeting with us tonight, um, was part of this group and um, she was especially valuable for her history as a national board member, um, letting us know some of what goes on at the national uh, when folks want consensus. Um, so I was the um, border collie and editor probably was most of my role um, in this group. I've been a member of state action in Nevada and Oregon and Colorado, all of whom run their action teams very differently, um, or in Nevada's case did. Um, and Gaethy and I are going to tag team and then Neil is going to weigh in when Gaethy and I get either stumped or everything wrong. <laughs> and Gaethy, do, do, do you want to, or you, you did your intro in the chat, so. I was just putting it into the chat, but I'm Gaethy okay. Weiss and want to emphasize, I'd be happy to answer further questions and I'll put my email address there. And it's my first name, which I guess isn't that straightforward to remember, but once you do remember it, it's easy. It, that's all right. I have to use is gaithia at gmail.com. Right. And Gaithia is the person who did probably the most reading. I mean, just dove in. I'm not surprised your eyes didn't fry over the amount of reading you, <laughs> you did. And then Neil, we were so pleased to have in our group um, an election secure election integrity expert. So um, so I am going to try to share my screen and see if I can make that work. And can you see this? Can you see my screen? Um, it's just black right now, Maude. It's, it's just black. Well, while she's putting her screen up, I'll just say, there we go. Uh, I'm amazed at how deeply Gaithia and Maude have gone into the world of election integrity. So it's an honor to work with them. Um, do, can anybody see my slide deck yet? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so that's a little bit about the team. That's what Karen said. Um, and um, Gaithia, this is yours because you have a big thumbprint on that bill. The, so, so this bill is the other reason why we have asked you folks to gather here this evening and talk about election security. It's the other impetus behind our wanting an election security position. Gaithia, you're on mute. Doesn't work. I got most heavily involved with this topic um, last legislative session with the LAC, Legislative Action Committee of the League of Women Voters of Colorado. And there was a proposed bill, SB 21188, that um, originally would have allowed all disabled voters to turn in their ballot over the internet. And that didn't depend on the type of disability and was just um, self-proposed in terms of how, how, um, how one would define dis disabled, which if you look at the possibilities could be as much as 20% of a population. And the problem with this is it's a huge security issue uh, to have that many, the more voters you have on a, a hackable system, the more tempting it would be to a nefarious person, 
a group of nefarious intentions to do something. Uh, so we worked hard uh, to talk to the legislators uh, in the Senate because it had already gotten through the House to uh, other way around the House had <laughs> gotten through the Senate and got it uh, amended to, and limited to uh, people with serious visual disabilities that would make them unable to use the paper ballot. And in terms of, well, that's sort of history now and why are we concerned about having a solid position statement as part of our, um, uh, you know, in our league documents is that this is likely to come up again this year. And it can be an issue going forward. It's a, it's a very tempting thing because um, as we'll get into here tonight, I think people are used to using the internet and they're used to having confidence in using the internet in certain other ways. And it would be nice if everybody could vote even easier uh, online, but that it's just too much of a risk. So, so we are interested not only just before Colorado, but knowing that Colorado has actually a very good election system in most aspects, um, looking at things nationally. And that's why we are pushing this now because to get some, a security system through to the national convention, we have a very short deadline. And so we are hoping to get some input from you tonight and to be able to discuss this with you and uh, get this through so that we can, as a league, be very effective in defending democracy. And if anybody is looking at the headlines tonight or recently, defending democracy is a pretty crucial thing right now. So as Karen said, um, we, we read, we studied, we wrote, we edited. Editing was a, um, was I think by argument is probably the best way to describe our editing. Karen actually sat in one, of, one or two of the editing meetings to get a flavor for what was going on. Um, and a week from this Saturday, so on the 22nd, we have a statewide Zoom meeting. Um, please do read the four documents beforehand. Um, there's a consensus, there are consensus questions. There's um, study material, about 15 pages of study material um, and um, a draft position. It's only a draft, it's, but it's we wanted to have a starting place. Um, Local leagues are welcome to have local consensus meetings, um, but we need, if they do, the responses back by January 30th, please. And we are happy to participate in those meetings and, and serve as resources to any local leagues that have questions. And we are hoping that you will at least dip into the documents and, and see what we've written and read it. Yes. Um, so. The goal of election security is that what gets reported by county election officials as the election outcome and transmitted to the Secretary of State is actually what, how people voted. Um, so if our county election official reports that Maria um, got more votes than Joe for the school board, that that is actually, that more people actually did vote for Maria um, than for Joe. It's fairly simple, but as you'll see as we go through this, it's, there can be some um, slips. Neil, our in-house expert, um, taught us some new language, all of it printable. Um, and he, evidence-based elections, voter verifiable software independence, um, risk limiting audits I already knew about and, and most of us do, but we went into a deeper dive on them. Um, so evidence-based elections are elections that are structured so that there's convincing evidence that the reported outcomes actually reflect how people voted. Um, so that people 
for example, actually believed that more people voted for Martha than voted for Joe when officials report that Maria won. Voter verifiable. Well, think about the paper ballot that we get in Colorado. We mark our ballot and then we can look at our ballot and see, yes, the mark is next to Maria's name, the person I wanted to vote for. Um, we can see that the, our ballot is as we intend it. Um, there is another way, and Neil is the one who understands this, and the rest of us are sort of going, oh, that sounds complicated. Um, so the other way is to be able to verify that one's vote is recorded and tabulated in the election center as intended. Um, and we'll get into a little more on how that might be done later. Um, software independence. If all the election software has errors or is hacked or both, um, you know, if the Russians got in and rewrote all our election software, that we can still tell how people voted without relying on the existing software is what software independence means. Currently, the only real way to do that is with paper ballots and risk limiting audits. Uh, let me just jump in for a second and, and say, I, so this is Neil, I, and I'm a computer scientist and you think, gosh, don't, don't I think computers are wonderful. Can you go back to that slide for a second? I can. Good. Um, and so uh, as a computer scientist with something as important as elections, I'm um, not willing to trust software. That's how easy it is to hack trust the software. You hear this all the time. And it's actually not even just existing software. We don't want to have to rely on any software in order to be able to count the votes. And just to cut to the chase, the easy way to do that is to have actual paper ballots that people actually verified that you could go through by hand and count in principle. You know, maybe you're going to use software, but you don't want to have to rely on it, especially since it can be hacked. So right. what was what was the there was a professor saying he's turned some students loose on on some election machines and it took them about 48 hours to to hack them. It's, yeah, I think every yeah. uh, every voting system that we've ever actually had good access to, we've found ways to hack them. So, yeah. you know, the, the point is to look at the paper with human eyes and get a sense for whether the paper actually supports the reported app. Yeah. Um, so photo registration databases, I think, Gaithia, this is your so I think that a lot of us are old enough here that we've had and perhaps had some experiences, election officials or election judges. And remember back in the day, you had these big poll books and uh, the reason precincts were the size they were was that was the size you could produce a poll book and go thumbing through it as the people came through in line to vote and, and verify that they were registered. So um, these days, of course, uh, we can do this more conveniently. I mean, there, there are um, some real wonderful things that we can do by having electronic records for voting, such as um, same day registration, such as um, being able to uh, check uh, with other databases in other states when people move and update things more expeditiously. Um, but of course we need to be sure that they are accurate and so they need to be auditable and they need to be protected from cyber attack as much as possible. And so you need a, a contingency backup plan to make sure that in case something is compromised, you haven't lost your actual data of registrations. Right. So, there are different kinds of, of attacks, cyber attacks, unauthorized off access. Um, you can, of course, have an election day failure of poll books, and in which case, usually there are paper backups. 
and uh, equipment failures and power outages. And of course, these days we're very attuned to various national natural disasters. But a lot of those things, the fact that they are electronic can offer greater flexibility. And I'm sure that will come into play with this fire when we have to figure out how people who don't actually reside where their homes used to be before they burned down can participate in our democracy effectively, knowing that they will return to where they were. And then moving on to uh, the, the next topic. And, and this is the one that I think is kind of the crux of the issue. This was what was very difficult to explain uh, to legislators because we are so used to these days really relying on things like our credit cards and, and our banking systems and um, I, 401k programs that are all online. Uh, and we need to understand why it is that voting is different than banking, shopping. Uh, and that is because of some of the limitations on voting, which for one thing, that the, that the actual vote is secret. If I make a bank transfer, the bank I'm taking money from and the bank I'm giving money to uh, both know who I am and how much I'm spending. But the other thing is, it is um, a, so in some cases absorbable. I mean, I call up my credit card company and I'm sure other people have had this experience and that's a false charge. And maybe the credit card company succeeds in finding out who they need to extract the false charge charges and can make criminal charges or maybe they just absorb that. And a huge amount of losses do get absorbed as part of doing businesses. But elect, if election systems are breached, we don't have that after the fact ability to redo the whole thing. And um, also in terms of cybersecurity into a computing system, that breach, that malware can be lying in wait for whatever opportunity that they had designed it for, uh, and it can sit there for years, and it can also disappear again after it had done its, its task uh, and not necessarily be recognized. Um, and there's no way to, to um, if the election is compromised, uh, there's really no way to, to go back and, and correct that. So if it's, on, if it's, if it's all electronic. If it's all if we electronic. Don't, if we don't have paper. Yeah. But so that's what's wonderful here in Colorado is that we do have paper ballots and we do have risk limiting audits so that we can um, check to make sure that things do seem to be going correctly. And at the same time, we don't have to do a total hand recount of the paper ballots, which itself, if, if you've ever been involved in a recount, and I have in way back, um, you're counting and counting and counting and counting, trying to get it to come up. Uh, the same is it's not necessarily a perfect system either, but with a risk limiting audit, you can say, this is the one we really have to pay attention to. It was a very close election uh, and we have to recount more ballots. The ones that won by a landslide obviously don't need that kind of attention. So the main thing to, to emphasize is that online systems are vulnerable to large scale attack and they're hard to detect and um, there's really no fix in sight. There, this, this is not a system that we can use at the present time or for the foreseeable future. And that is something that, that we had some um, backup with uh, some election security experts on when we were working with the legislature. Um, I actually was able to get some of the people to um, write in um, it's a letter of uh, 50 cybersecurity experts uh, spearheaded by the American Association for the Advancement of Science and uh, American Association of Computing Machinery. And we'll get to that, I guess, in a minute. Yes, it's further down. So um, yeah, there's no, there's no end in sight for this. So there's a difference between a voter receiving a blank ballot over the internet 
like the blank ballots that get mailed to us in Colorado versus marking their ballot and then returning it over the internet. Receiving a blank ballot is one thing. Um, you, we can check and make sure when we get our ballot, this is what, what it should be. But once we've marked our ballot, someone can get in, some nefarious actor can get in in the middle between the time we hit send and the time it's received at the election center and change our, change our, our ballot. Um, there are some voters who cannot handle a paper ballot privately and independently. Those who are blind, those who have other physical, some other physical disabilities, so they can't use a paper ballot. Um, and uh, that was handled in um, the revised, the amended version um, of the bill that KTFRP worked on last year. Um, the MOVE Act talks about uh, Yokava, Uniformed and Overseas Citizens Absentee Voters. Um, federal law, they have to be mailed absentee ballots at least 45 days before a federal election, or they can request to have blank ballots delivered electronically. The MOVE Act does not require that those voters can return their ballots over the internet. This is where our friend Randy lives. Life is rough, but you know, somebody's got to do it. Uh, that's Grenada in the background. He is a US citizen. Um, he was able to receive his ballot over the internet, um, but there is no federal requirement that he can return his ballot over the internet. Um, this is during a race around the island. Um, but most times he is moored in a bay and goes on to land for lunch every day. Um, so to find someone with a printer would not be a great hardship for him. But, you know, living on a boat in the Caribbean, that might be tough. Um, what do these four federal agencies have in common? They all warn states that returning ballots over the internet has a very high cybersecurity risk, vulnerable to disruption, and they all recommended that internet that only voters with no other way to return their ballot be allowed to return their ballot over the internet. And this Can is- Can you do that one more time, Maud? I just wanna make one. Yes. Uh, quick point so they do not recommend internet ballot return for anyone they recommend that if election officials uh, are required by state law to allow internet return that it only be provided for voters with no other way so it's just a, a little nuance but yeah but yeah. yeah, I would agree that's crucial. And I would add that since I wrote the material that's in our study, uh, there has been a federal case, which is, again, why it's so important to get something in the league to the national level into the impact on issues for our position at the uh, for the United States is uh, in the most recent authorization of the National Fence Authorization Act that was passed, I believe, in uh, last October, uh, the initial wording of that bill uh, funded quite a bit to expand the use of the internet for uh, these Yuokava voters. And that then um, was quashed by these teams of cybersecurity experts who were very concerned that any expansion would raise huge cybersecurity risks. And actually, uh, because a lot of those are military people uh, could, could actually uh, be a, a military security issue if malware were directed at military systems because in the attempt to influence an election. Uh, and I, can, I will add that material to the study at, at some point. But again, I think I want to add, mention it now because it is why it's so important that the league to be 
fully um, able to defend democracy that we have a pos firm position statement at the national level. Right, and I'll just add one other piece of that then. For a voter with no other way to return a ballot, you know, somebody who's on a submarine for months at a time or whatever, it's also, you can consider it technically a security problem that they can't return a ballot because that also changes the election. If that happens a lot, it disenfranchises people. It's a big deal. We care about voting rights. So that's why our position and CISA's position, uh, these agencies basically say, when there's no other way, then let's try to find the best alternative we can. I, I, I think this, I, I think the most important point, excuse me for interjecting, yeah. the most important po part of this particular conversation is that, is that the internet is hackable. We don't want to restrict per individual voters' ability to be able to vote, but we do need to limit how many vote using the internet because the greater the number you have voting that way, the more the greater the ability for that election to be hacked. So the desire is to minimize that as much as possible without infringing upon an individual voter's ability or right to vote. Exactly. Thank you, Karen. And Gathia, this is your slide. This is this is the letter that you. Th this talks about the the two entities that weighed in at your request on um, the original version of the Dis voting with disabilities bill last session, and they basically said, internet voting is not ready for prime time. It's inherently insecure, and there's um, there's it, it's not going to be secure in the foreseeable future. And you're on mute. They led the effort. These two organizations, the leader, um, um, uh, the person I talked to was Michael Fernandez of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, but also the Association for Computing Machinery. They spearheaded the effort. The effort wasn't just those two groups. They had over 50 signatories of cybersecurity experts on that letter. And a similar letter uh, started with a, a slightly different group of people, but many of the same signatures. Um, was done for the most recent effort against uh, the expansion of the internet voting in the National Defense Authorization Act. And, and I'll just point out that, you know, actually a lot of people are frustrated that, you know, gosh, can't you just fix this problem? Hey, you technical people, why don't you just fix it? I mean, this is one of the top um, problems, interesting problems, things that we would love to fix. We would love to, and we have some very clever and complicated techniques to uh, get past a bunch of the issues that have come up. But I, one of the things that is still the hardest to do is to actually identify who somebody is at the other end of the internet without once again exposing their privacy and exposing them to third party private databases and, and a bunch of other things. So anyway, we're working hard on this, honestly. But uh, as, as uh, they're pointing out, it's an enormously hard problem and we're not there. And the nefarious people are uh, working equally hard and for everything that we have done to increase uh, encryption in the cybersecurity, there are people working to figure out how to break into those things. So it's complicated. Yes, yes the two groups are, are chasing each other. I went to grad school in an urban environment in um, a school with a lot of engineering students surrounded by some people who liked bicycles, um, liked other people's bicycles. And so there was a little, a little arms race between the students designing better bicycle locks and the people in the neighborhood designing better ways to get through the locks. And that was just about bicycles. This is about defending democracy, but it's still an arms race. And I have a son-in-law who works uh, for Northrop and we, we were talking grandchildren earlier. And one of my daughter's problems when about to give birth was that he works in a totally isolated system and it's not allowed, you know, at, once he enters it at the beginning of the day, there's no communication with the outside. 
and that right. that's one effort at national defense security for whatever it is he's doing. Right. So here is the tough to look at slide again. Um, Randy on his boat in the Caribbean can receive a blank ballot over the internet showing both Maria and Joe running for school board. But once he marks his ballot showing that he wants Maria to win, um, it's much more secure for him to return that marked, return a marked paper ballot by mail than to try to return his ballot over the internet. If he is this your slide? Uh, yes. Yeah. So um, I this is another method. I, I don't want to belabor it here, but there are talks about you know why are why are these systems not quite ready to be used? Uh, and the one of the problems with existing end-to-end -end verifiable internet voting, which is E2E VIV, uh, is commonly called, uh, is that um, there are things that you can do on either end. You can hack the, the voter's device. Um, the individual voter's computer is not necessarily secure. There are still privacy risks. And there, there, this is something that, that we would promote because it's better uh, for um, those who can't, who need to use the internet. We want to have them using the most secure method possible, but we want everybody to be aware that it's still not good enough, really. And, and I think that is the, the ultimate, the ultimate thing is the, that uh, again, we can be proud we're in Colorado and we use paper ballots. And if at all possible, paper ballots are much tougher to do a large scale attack. I mean, clearly there are cases where ballot boxes have disappeared or something like that in the past, but but in general, it, it's not as susceptible to uh, totally affecting a significant election. Right. And and so again, uh, actually, I would say Neil would be a better person to ask than me if you have uh, any specific interest in E two E V I V methods. But that's and and Neil just added in our outline that. Um, the best place to start is to have individuals um, who can't use a paper ballot go to polling places and use. Uh, well, uh, let, let me just expand okay. a little bit. So um, I, th there is magic here. And again, computer scientists love this stuff. There are magic ways, not just for disabled people, but for everyone voting in a, a polling place to not only verify like that their piece of paper looks good, but to, to check later on to get what we call, uh, it, it's, it's confusing to call it a receipt, but they often call them receipts, to get something that uh, looks like gobbledygook typically, but it allows them to take that later on to a computer or to a third party and to say, prove to me that my vote was actually tabulated and shows up in the final result the way that I wanted it to. So this is magic and you can do that without being able to prove how you voted to somebody else. So we won't go into the details, but there are things that you can do and the way to, to move in that direction, which is even better than where we are today with paper ballots, would be to do that in polling places. And when we get experience with that, maybe the same sort of thing will someday be um, yet more effective when you're voting remotely over the internet. So, so I would quick say- Quick ad for something that we're, we're, we're working on, but yeah. again, uh, only practical, uh, only um, makes sense for people who would otherwise be disenfranchised. And that's a very small set of people. And I would say here that I think that the reason this comes up as part of our position statement is that we did not want to be absolute and set in stone at the national level that the league said absolutely unconditionally forever, you have to have paper ballots. We want to say for the foreseeable future, this is what works, but we want to be able to give future leagues uh, ability to intelligently evaluate these newer methods and at such time as they become feasible, that may be a better way to go. But so that's just 
I'm, I'm a scientist and uh, as you can tell with COVID and anything else, scientists always leave plenty of wiggle room and gray areas and never are willing to say absolutely this way. And, and that is what, if you look at the position statement, that's why it mentions this. And so I don't, again, I don't, I don't want to get, I think we should go on to the next topic until somebody asks a question. <laughs> Um, and, and, and just one other thing, when, when any of us say position statement, this is a draft that we have and whatever comes out in the consensus meetings, uh, meeting or meetings um, will be used to revise the draft as, as needed because of course it's the state membership as a whole that, that um, um, gives input in two positions. Just to reinforce Gathia's last statement too, you don't want a position statement to be so narrow that next year it has to be revised and changed. So that's that that was a, a consideration as well. We wanted something that would, you know, stand the test of time, obviously not indefinitely, but would get us, you know, so that this process doesn't have to be done every year again and again. <laughs> Yes, thank you. <laughs> so the next topic that we looked at was transparency. Um, and should members of the public be allowed to observe what's going on in the election process, be allowed to access copies of the source code, samples of election equipment, copies or images of ballots, but, but with personal identifying information removed. So if I've scribbled my name on it, um, that that is, is redacted, is that's taken off, out so that people can't see that Maud voted for Maria, um, and copies of election procedures, and to do all of this without interfering in an ongoing election process. Um, but we thought it's probably not wise. And we had, of course, an example in uh, Colorado to allow the public to have access to election system passwords or the original ballots or the actual equipment that's used in an election um, or the actual software used in that election equipment. We also think that chain of custody is important, i.e. Um, knowing having a procedure for your ballot goes into the ballot box and then who, what group takes it out of the ballot box and what group transports it to the election center and what happens to it as it goes through the election center, that that is all very carefully documented and we know who had access to the, to the uh, ballots when, and um, that we, that also that chain of custody procedure is followed. And now um, that is the end of our nifty little slideshow. Um, consensus meeting on Zoom a week from Saturday, the 22nd. Um, please do look at the documents, um, email us with questions, here's contact info. Um, and I will add mine um, to the chat. I'll stop. Well, maybe somebody could add mine to the chat because if I stop screen sharing, then you all can't see this stuff also. I'll, I'll add it for you, Rob. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <coughs> And um, when you're ready, I'll stop screen sharing, but do people have questions? Or are you all just numb? <clears throat> Did we fail to confuse anybody? <laughs> I do not see any hands up. Does anybody think that election security is not an important issue? I'm 
I'm not hearing anything there. I'm going to- uh, Is Neil still on? Somebody was asking him to be introduced, explain your background, Neil. Uh, sure, hi, I put it in the chat, but I'm uh, Neil McBurnett. I'm a computer scientist. I uh, introduced risk limiting audits to Colorado uh, over the last, you know, making audits better and better over the last 20 years. So, you know, I've, I've been active in the field uh, for uh, as the vagarities of elections go in all kinds of different directions. And Colorado has been a fabulous place to work in this for a variety of unusual reasons. So, um, and again, uh, totally delighted to find such amazing uh, team members as Gaithia and Maud and Tony and Karen and, and all these folks that are, are willing to dive deep into something that a lot of people think elections ought to be like really simple. You just kind of let people hold up their hands and you count their hands and you're all done. The way that the, the number of ways that we make elections uh, convenient makes it really challenging to make them secure. So that's really why we're trying to, to bring things together. And so I've been we, in the Boulder League for 20 or 25 years. Thank, thanks, Neil. Uh, somebody has asked how the twenty, the January twenty second meeting is going to be run. So, Mon, I'm going to let you take the lead on that. She's Mon's done an awful lot of um, planning and organizing. We're going to do a dry run next week. So, some of what she says tonight could be tweaks and change, but um, the the general plan, Mon. Right. Um, we are planning this um, to send the, to Jan's question. Um, first, we are planning to send out um, the Zoom link um, with an agenda, um, with another link to the LWVCO folder that our documents are in. This did go out. This has been out, I think, at least twice. Um, if you anyone wants to scroll back through the uh, December board notice mailing, um, it was. The Zoom link has not been out yet, but the link to the documents and the other information is in that. And then the most recent um, email that went out from LWVCO on um, general information had also the link to the folder and um, time and uh, date. Um, so it is, it is out there in our emails and we'll send another one. Um, tomorrow this week tomorrow yes oh fabulous uh yeah I was going to ask that devil's advocate question of um have do people know I, we're talking at the beginning of just the problem of trying to wade through our emails to get to the zoom link to get here which we all succeeded at that are here uh but how many people have waited and would you please please wade back through to the emails from beth uh and look at the um documents and i think the the draft position we probably were we spent a lot of time editing and we're probably much more coherent than we were tonight and then all of the information backing that is uh that we had is in the study documents and then there's a letter on the why we think we need a position and get it through the national level and all of that i really 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 hope that those People of you here at... and anybody you know in the league that ought to be as interested as you are of having shown up here is a proof of interest will will pursue um and and also uh the the consensus questions so the um <coughs> consensus meeting um i'm hoping for a very good turnout um, and so we're going to start with people introducing themselves in the chat um, and um, talk a little bit about, again, um, why, we, why we are here and um, then go through the consensus questions with some, some, a little bit of, small bit of background and some discussion and um, Zoom voting because um, we have, I don't know, something like 26 questions when you count all the subparts. Um, and 
Beth, I'm hoping before the email goes out tomorrow that I can get you an agenda. An agenda. Um, so, Excellent. Please do. Yeah, I'm just making a note. Um, and I see and, Christina's uh, ha hand up. Christina has a hand up, and there's some more questions in just, the slide. Just so you know what Jeffco is going to do, um, we've already posted the documents on our website. Um, on Monday morning, our newsletter will go out with a letter from me encouraging everybody to attend. We will bring it up again. We have a briefing committee meeting on Tuesday to mention to the unit leaders, and then I will probably send a blast email out on Thursday. Fabulous. Um, we did like not to have you guys come in, which I'm kind of regretting now, but I, we are heavily promoting getting people to read the information. Thank you so very much. Um, Barb, I see your question in the slide. Um, you're saying you're, that that assumes the transfer of, of ballots within the chain of custody is secure. Is that your question? Well, I had a comment about the consensus sure. meeting too, but yeah, I had that question. Um, Did you want to answer the question first or? Yeah. Um, yes, uh, we, we, there, there, there should be a, a secure chain of custody. Right. Um, that is, that is documented and, and followed. So yes. Okay. And then your question on consensus. And, and, and let me just expand oh. on that. This is actually one of the harder things to do. Um, and, and people often say, gosh, you know, how do you keep paper secure? We obviously know that there have been many elections in US history where the paper was not kept secure or ballot boxes were stuffed. And so procedures for doing that uh, are important. They're in place in various places. Frankly, it's, it can be hard to really uh, publish and rely on evidence to do that. And one way to do that that we are kind of working on would be some way of publishing the images um, from a very early on point in time that could be compared with the paper ballots when the audit is done. So, I mean, that's just one of the challenges. We have these risk limiting audits that are great for uh, tabulation audits, but as you point out, the risk limiting audit uh, assumes that the chain of custody of the paper ballots is, is, is so accurate. Sure. So we also need to audit the chain of custody. We need to do reconciliation audits. We need to audit the eligibility. We need to find ways of making sure that people, you know, that, that, that people were eligible to vote and they didn't vote too many times and that everyone who was eligible had an opportunity to vote. So an evidence-based election is the overall term for getting evidence for all those points. And they're all important. And frankly, some of them are still very tricky. All right. Well, one of the things I was thinking about, <clears throat> and I've been in, a, in an election judge, and when we did voting machines, <clears throat> how we had a certain procedure to follow and we put all the tapes and the ballot page, paper trails in bags and locked them up and delivered them, you know, one from each party, so forth and so on. But we have a lot of drop boxes all over Weld County. And, you know, I take mine down to the bank, which goes down below the <laughs> level of the earth. But somebody's got, and also we have a drop box out by Ames. And so what happens when, you know, what's the procedure for picking up those loose ballots and getting them back to the elections department? And I've been there when they come in, but I don't know what the procedures is for taking them out of the ballot, back ballot ballot boxes and stuff. Well, okay. anyway, my questions on a couple of things, uh, we're doing the same thing in Greeley Weld about getting everybody organized and on board and we're having the election team come and do a presentation for us and we're getting things out uh, through our voter, the links to documents and we're gonna do a you know, promotion at the beginning of the week to make sure people get the information they need. Um, what was the other thing? Oh, I was gonna say one of the things we decided to do uh, in the proce whole procedure of things is that we put in an option for our league and our leadership council adopted this last Tuesday, that if there were any serious issues or concerns that came up at the consensus meeting, we would convene our leadership council to discuss those and weigh in if there's something that 
was different or egregious we felt needed to be addressed as a league, not just individually. So then that just, there was another comment in our conversation is if there would ever be any breakout groups where people would be able to talk to each other because I don't know, we're gonna have a hundred people or 25 people <laughs> and how unwieldy that can get. But I guess with 36 questions, we don't have a lot of choices. But there is a concern about that. I just wanted to share that. Sure. I, sure. I think that's justifiable, but at the same time, Barb, too, I would counter by saying it's probably important that everybody in the meeting hears what those concerns are. And if you have breakout groups, it makes it may make it difficult for the entire membership or participants to, to hear all of the questions and all of the concerns that can certainly be something that that we talk about as we run through the go through the dry run next week is that so right well and are we going to have time limits on each of those sections and things like that yeah, yeah. okay yeah um there there was one question in the chat early on that um if 